A greetings network. Welcome to today's echo session. Uh, you may just confirm if, uh, if I'm audible. You are audible. Great. Yeah, so you're welcome to today's uh, uh, case presentation on the post echo session, of which the topic of discussion today will be influenza surveillance prevention and uh, clinical management. And uh, of course, we'll have uh, the expert um, uh, that will be available, Dr. Sombo Koloshi, Professor Lloyd Mulenga, Dr. Matipula Peter, you know, there's also uh, Dr. Mwaka Monze. Uh, these are part of the, uh, the panel of experts. And of course, we'll get the didactic presentation from uh, Dr. Shalomba Chitanika. Uh, so if, even as we've seen, we are having a stage of uh, uh, sorry cases. It's very important that we get to listen to this, uh, to this talk and we prepare questions accordingly. And of course, uh, like the echo etiquette, we make sure that our mics are muted. We only speak when given an opportunity to speak. And then uh, we use the chat box uh, if, in case you, you, want to, you don't want to forget as the presentation is running, make sure that we use the chat box. And then uh, from there, we'll be able to attend to your concerns. And then as the polls will be coming, we uh, anticipate 100% uh, participation from the network so that we know that we are engaging and we are together. So everyone is welcome um, to this echo session of today. Uh, Dr. Chitanika, greetings. Good afternoon, Dr. Moewa, and uh, good afternoon to the network. Always a pleasure having mm -hmm. Dr. Chitanika. So uh, we'll allow you to, to introduce the topic and uh, to run us through the didactic presentation for today. Dr. Chitanika. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Moewa. So, Again, I think it's uh, no secret that we have noted the rise in the number of um, of cases of people presenting with um, respiratory infections. Uh, so we this presentation is going to have two parts. So in the first part, we are going to get a, a presentation from uh, Dr. Marka Monzi from the UTH Virology Laboratory so that she just gives uh, the house a um, a snapshot of what's going on on the ground so that the, the house is made aware that what we are discussing today is not uh, something just purely limited to theory. It's uh, something that also has a practical aspect. Uh, later in the presentation, we'll also show some uh, X-ray images of some patients that we've been seeing through this period. Um, that's uh, how we we'll move uh, to the presentation, Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, is Dr. Maka Monze ready to, to present? Uh, yes, she's she's on the call. She's on the call. Uh, right after the poll questions, uh, we'll we'll be able to 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 move the to move the slides for her. Uh, her slides are part of the presentation. Oh, okay, even better. Uh, we'll allow the IT team to uh, to start running the the, the presentation. So our learning objectives for this session, uh, we have four major learning objectives. The first one is we'll discuss the epidemiology of influenza, we'll also discuss the clinical manifestations and the diagnosis, and of course, the, the treatment. And I think at this juncture, we can have the IT team run the, the four questions. So to launch the first poll, uh, poll number one. So we're seeing which of the following types of influenza have been isolated in Zambia. So we have uh, influenza type A, we have influenza type B, and uh, C is saying both influenza A and B. Okay, I can see the network is already participating, and I'll encourage that uh, more participation comes through. Which of the following types of influenza have been isolated in Zambia? So it's just a single choice. Either go with A, go with B, or both A and B. 
So I'll allow the code to run the next, uh, next 10 seconds. We had 60% participation. Everyone is encouraged to participate. Remember, we don't get to see your, your response as an individual, but the statistics from our end. So feel free to participate, even as the polls are coming through. Okay, so I'm the poll. So Dr. Stanika, that's the feedback from the network. 62% uh, they think both type A and type B have been isolated. And then now 23% they, they think it's only type A and 14% think it's only type B. No, no that's, uh, that's well noted. We'll run, we we'll rerun the poll at the end of the presentation and um, see the response we'll get. Uh, we can run the second poll now. The second poll. So that's our second poll. Serology is a use of clinical tool for the diagnosis of influenza. So is it a, is, it's a true or false uh, question. Serology is a use of clinical tool for the diagnosis of influenza. Okay. I love the feedback from the network. Let's continue participating. We had 50, we had 60% now participation. Let's continue participating. The poll will run for the next 10 seconds before we close it. Okay, so the network uh, thinks uh, serology is a use of clinical tool for the diagnosis of uh, influenza. And then we have 39% that are saying it's false. That's the feedback, Dr. Stanek. Thank you, Dr. Mwewa. We can um, run the third poll. Okay, so to run the third poll. So interesting poll. Steroids are a mainstay of treatment in patients with pneumonia due to influenza. True or false? Steroids are a mainstay of treatment in patients with pneumonia due to influenza. Yeah, let's continue participating. It's quite encouraging to see that the network is a uh, is responding. We had sixty-four percent participation, and let's continue. Okay, more feedback is demanded. We had seventy-two percent. Now, allow the port to run for the next five seconds. This is an interesting one. Uh, I'll end the poll. So Dr. Stanik and the expert panels, yeah, that's the feedback. We have 52% uh, that are saying false, and uh, we have 49% that are saying true. Steroids are the mainstay of treatment in patients with uh, pneumonia due to influenza. That's almost uh, split in the middle. Yeah. Uh, so. Again, with that being said, I think we will move to the first part of the presentation, which will be uh, having Dr. Monze address us with uh, some data from surveillance. Uh, Dr. Monze, are you available to, to just greet the, the house and uh, address us? Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitanik. I am, and um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, oh, 
I hope you can see me, but I won't keep the video on uh, so that I don't interfere with my connection. Yes, yes, Dr. Monze, we can hear you loud and clear. So just for the house, uh, Dr. Monze is the head of the virology lab at the university teaching hospitals and uh, one of the key people involved in terms of surveillance for, for influenza. It's um, work that she's been doing for quite some time and has uh, has been uh, very tremendous and, and key in helping us uh, with this outbreak. Uh, so Dr. Monze, uh, please, uh, you may take the floor and uh, present. Uh, thank you, and uh, good afternoon once again to everyone. Uh, I'm grateful to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to share uh, data on influenza uh, that uh, has been coming in from the Sentinel Surveillance uh, Program in uh, patients uh, with severe acute respiratory illnesses, the so-called SARI, patients and patients with influenza-like illnesses, uh, the so-called ILI um, patients. Um, this uh, program has been running, as you heard from um, Dr. Chitanika, for um, a long time uh, out of the UTH Virology Laboratory. And uh, as part uh, of our work, we have been recognized by the World Health Organization as one of the national influenza uh, centers that provides data to the global influenza surveillance and response system. So all the data that we collect is actually shared uh, worldwide so that uh, the world can understand uh, what is happening uh, with influenza. It's a it's a pathogen of interest because of its potential to cause uh, pandemics. Um, next slide. So I'll begin first by just giving an uh, overview of how the surveillance system is set up. And uh, this will help us understand, I think, some of the data that uh, we'll be looking at. Uh, so the system was established around 2008, 2009, and I think by 2010, maybe it had stabilized and we were now a bit more comfortable with the data that was coming in. Uh, it covers the general population or ages uh, of patients presenting to selected health facilities, uh, which are function as sentinel sites uh, across the country. Uh, these patients have to fit particular case definitions. The ILI patients, we look for fever and cough uh, of less than 10 days duration. So that's a very broad um, um, case definition. Uh, these are outpatients. Uh, for the SARI patients, we look for uh, patients with a similar presentation, fever and cough, uh, less than 10 days, but they are sick enough to be hospitalized. So the SARIs are inpatients. We also look for uh, what we call PUIs or persons under investigation. These are SARI patients that uh, have exposure risk to highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, for sampling at each sentinel site, as I said, the ILI uh, case definition is very broad. Uh, so if we were to uh, capture every patient with ILI uh, at each sentinel site, it would be more than we could uh, handle uh, in the laboratories. So we, we sample five, but this is enough to give us a picture of what's happening on the ground. For the SARI cases, we sample all of them. Um, we collect uh, nasopharyngeal swabs and oropharyngeal swabs, which I'm sure since COVID we are all familiar with, with um, those uh, dreaded swabs. Uh, and uh, these uh, we test for influenza. Uh, if we have a positive for influenza, we subtype them. The influenza A's can be subtyped into H1N1 pandemic strain, H3N2, H5, or H7. And then the influenza Bs can be uh, subtyped into Yamagata lineage and Victoria lineage. We also routinely test 
for um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, since the emergence of um, this pathogen. Uh, we test for other respiratory pathogens as indicated uh, in these samples. And then the data that we collect is compiled into weekly surveillance reports that are shared with stakeholders. Uh, those of you who receive the ZNPHI IDSR bulletin will have uh, been able to see some of our data uh, there. And we also upload onto um, the uh, global web-based platforms uh, called FluNet and FluID. Uh, where uh, everybody can access. Uh, continue. Next slide, please. So this is just to quickly show you the health facilities that are serving as Sentinel sites. I hope we have some of um, our Sentinel staff uh, present in this uh, meeting. You'll be happy to see uh, the, the fruit of your labors, some of the outputs of uh, the work that is done. So we are in six um, districts currently. Uh, those are marked in with the red dots. Uh, the blue dots are where we would like to go uh, if we'll be able to um, expand. Uh, you'll notice that we have two uh, pediatric sentinel sites at UTH and Arthur Davison. And uh, in these two sites, uh, we are also doing surveillance uh, not just for flu and COVID, but also for respiratory sensitivity of vi virus, which is an important pediatric pathogen. Next slide, please. So briefly, uh, the procedure at the uh, surveillance sites, uh, like I said, the, the trained staff will identify the patients meeting the case definition. They get uh, verbal consent. Uh, since this is surveillance, we have a non-research determination. They fill out a case investigation form, collecting demographic information, uh, case classification information, how severe is the illness, the medical history, risk factors, and uh, things like that. We also, for each of the uh, Sentinel sites, collect denominator data, which is information on total outpatient visits or total admissions, total respiratory visits. And this helps us to um, uh, interpret what uh, we are seeing, the data that we are seeing. So the swabs are collected and transported to the laboratories. Uh, the main laboratory is the one at uh, UTH Virology, but we also uh, receive support from TDRC and the ZNPHRL laboratory for some of the testing. Uh, we are using open PCR systems for all our um, testing and uh, results are fed back to the Sentinel sites. Uh, we are, um, migrating to a completely digital system. So very soon, uh, the Sentinel sites will be able to see the results almost real time. Uh, the data is analyzed, as I said, and um, reported weekly. Next slide. So in the lab, what do we do? We test for influenza and COVID. We are using a multiplex assay or a duplex assay that can at once test for both. If um, the specimen is negative, it's immediately reported. If it's positive, uh, depending on the subtype of the influenza, if it's a, a novel influenza, a subtype of interest, that one has to be referred to WHO immediately. If it's the seasonal influenza that we see uh, all the time from year to year, um, we just subtype and uh, then report, but we, send a sample of those viruses to the WHO uh, quarterly. And uh, this is what they use to manufacture seasonal vaccines that uh, are administered for flu prevention. Next slide. Okay. So um, this is uh, some of the data that uh, we have been looking at. Uh, I selected, um, that we have been producing, sorry, I selected data, most recent data for the past four months. And this table is showing data from April up to up to July. Um, I think we'll have an updated report uh, for tomorrow, but this will help us to see. Uh, if you look at the, the, the very light uh, blue that shows the influenza bees, the mid middle colored blue shows the influenza A's, and then the very dark on the far end 
column. The last column is showing the COVID um, results. Um, you'll notice the influ influenza A's, we've had a lot of activity in the time period that we are looking at. We've had a lot of positives. And um, most of those have been influenza H1N1 2009 pandemic subtype, uh, as well as H3. We've also had a few, just a few influenza B positives, uh, and uh, all of those have been the Victoria lineage. We, we haven't seen Yamagata for several years. And uh, I know um, on the social media and everywhere, people were worried that uh, COVID has come back. But uh, from our surveillance data, we have seen almost no COVID, very, very little. Next slide, please. So this slide is just showing in graphic form um, the data I've just presented, but it's actually going back to 2003, showing what we saw last year, as well as what we have seen um, so far um, this year. If you look at the 2024 data so far, we have actually um, seen H3, which is the bluish green uh, color, and then the pure blue color is the H1N1 pandemic 2009, and the red is the flu B um, Victoria. So these are the main seasonal viruses that are seen all over the world. So what we are seeing is not an unusual picture to the rest of the, to the, rest of the, the world. The 2024, we started off with H3, but um, H1N1 pandemic emerged um, from around week 19 uh, up, to, up to now. The black line is showing the rate of infection, uh, and you will see that um, it has been going up, although uh, the last few weeks of, da of data, I would uh, take with a pinch of salt because data is continuously coming in. Uh, the numbers are few, so they may be distorting the picture a bit. But in any case, we've seen that we've had uh, a lot of uh, flu virus circulation, um, uh, more than we saw, I think, in the same period um, last year. Um, I think um, people may wonder about um, seasonality. Uh, over the years, we we haven't really been able to uh, establish seasonality, unlike what is seen in the Northern Hemisphere, where they have a clear flu season uh, in the cold season. For us, we can have flu at any time of the year. Uh, but... Uh, Probably in most years, you'll find that around April to May, you always you always um, have it, or most of the time, we will have it. Next slide. So this is the data broken down by district, by Sentinel uh, districts with the Sentinel sites. Um, if, uh, you see that for H1N1 pandemic, uh, Livingstone uh, and Lusaka had a bit more. Uh, for the H3, and dollar uh, had a bit uh, more. Next slide. And this is the data broken down for the past month uh, by, by age group. Uh, H1 pandemic, H1N1 pandemic has been affecting nearly uh, all age groups, uh, as well as uh, H3 has been affecting all age groups, maybe the older people have been less um, affected. Next slide. Okay, so this slide is showing um, the outputs from a, a mathematical model or a program that we use to look at our data and compare it with historical data. Like I said, we have data going back to uh, 
2010 or so. So when we compare what we have seen in the past, what we are seeing this season, is it worse than anything we have ever seen? That's what the model answers. So if you look at the larger picture in the background, it is showing um, the ILI SARI data in total. And it's showing that compared to previous years, we are just a, we have just broken the threshold from a low season to a moderate season. But if you look uh, at the smaller graph uh, in the foreground, uh, there we have selected just the SARI data, and that gives us a sense of the severity of the season. Uh, from what we have seen in previous years, you can see that this year we broke the threshold uh, from a low severe season to a moderately severe season. And I think it's it's been a while since we broke that threshold. So probably why we are seeing uh, many sick uh, uh, patients. Uh, this is a particularly uh, severe season compared to what we've seen in the past. So uh, Dr. Chitanik, I think those uh, were my slides. Uh, that's what I had for us. I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Monzi. And I, again, I hope that uh, the house has appreciated the, the situation. So before we went into the clinical part, again, we wanted to to make sure that the house was uh, was just informed on what's going on on the ground and that we, we do have um, this unusually high number of patients. So uh, I will delve into the clinical aspect and the application on the ground. I did notice that uh, we had some hands raised. I, I would request that uh, uh, our colleagues bank those patients uh, till we reach the end of the session. So. A bit about influenza. Influenza is um, really an acute respiratory illness that is caused by the influenza virus. Most of us know it as the flu. Um, as you have heard from the preceding speaker, we do have these outbreaks uh, and they occur nearly, nearly every year. So what's the significance of an influenza outbreak? So first of all, there are two significant things that come from it. So the first thing is that it is a significant cause of morbidity. In terms of morbidity, there is loss of days from work, loss of days from school going children, and so on. And then there's also the mortality aspect, where we do have uh, quite a number of people dying. Even though we do not have official records of how many people die from Zambia, uh, records estimate that at least half a million people die from influenza each year. In terms of the virology, we know that influenza belongs to the family of orthomics or viruses. We have three types, there's influenza A, influenza B, and influenza C. It's useful to know a bit about uh, the virus itself, that it has a lipid bilayer, which you can see, and then there are two uh, proteins I would like to bring to your attention. So there is the hemagglutinin and the neuroaminidase, which really play a a big role in terms of how the virus enters the cell. In terms of, uh, I would request that we have uh, to able to mute our mics. Just a reminder, please, uh, for those that have their mics unmuted, they are disrupting the flow. Thank you. Yeah, so in terms of the hemagglutinin and neuroaminidase proteins, so these play a role in viral entry into the cell. Now I know that fresh from the COVID pandemic, uh, the question that people may be asking themselves is which receptors are these used? So these usually go into the cell that are found uh, on the respiratory epithelium. So again, a kind appeal to, to the house to please keep your mics on, on mute. Thank you. 
So these are the differences between the three different types of influenza. So as you will notice, influenza C does not affect uh, humans. Uh, so the main pathogens that cause disease So the main pathogens that affect humans are influenza A and influenza B. And uh, there's some concepts that you need to, that we need to bring at play at this moment. So influenza A is responsible for pandemics and uh, outbreaks because it has a greater potential towards uh, changing itself. And this is where we talk about the concepts of what is an antigenic shift and the drift and so on. So influenza is not new. It's been around for over 100 years. And as you see, it's been causing death from that time. So the first major um, pandemic from influenza was in 1918, when we had over 500 million people infected and over 50 million deaths. So since that time, we've had um, quite a number of pandemics, some moderate, some uh, uh, severe. As you see, the last outbreak of influenza that we had in terms of the pandemic was in 2009-2010 where we had the swine flu which uh, caused uh, 17,000 deaths. So in terms of the exact timing and peak of influenza, really these tend to vary uh, and it's not known why they vary. In countries like Zambia, we expect the peak of cases to be during the cold season and then the other aspect is that persons of all ages are usually susceptible to influenza. Most countries don't know how big the burden of influenza is, the true burden, because a lot of people never really seek medical help or, or get diagnosed. Again, this is just to illustrate where we're coming from, that we have had these periods. So you notice the Spanish flu, then we had the Asian flu about 30 years later, and then we had the pandemic again a few years later. And finally, in 2009, we had the, the swine flu that uh, also spread. So these outbreaks tend to, to spread. And we'll see why we can't seem to get rid of this bug. In terms of transmission, again, everyone is susceptible to influenza, though there are some people that are susceptible to having greater severity of disease. So these will be children under the age of five or the elderly, those above 65 or even those above 50, those with any form of immunosuppression. In terms of infectiousness, so with, with COVID, we saw that we have this uh, uh, really marked transmission even from asymptomatic cases, but with influenza, the transmission peaks usually a day or so after onset of symptoms. And uh, in terms of the uh, infection rate or the reproductive number, ranges between 1.3 to 1.7. These are usually people from the households or, or close contacts of the patients. Uh, now, um, in terms of survival time, the virus can survive for around eight hours uh, outside the host. So again, the modes of transmission is uh, respiratory secretions. So with influenza, it's been noted that uh, it spreads more rapidly with aerosols as opposed to droplets. There are some people that think that there is spread through surfaces, though this has not really been established in epidemiological settings. So currently the, the thought is that uh, the major route of spread is through aerosols. So another key thing with influenza is uh, how long someone can infect others. So with COVID, I know that people are used to the two to 14 days, but with influenza, most most people will typically stop shedding the virus uh, between two to five days after the symptoms first appear. Uh, and then another key thing that continues to push the spread of influenza is really the human mobility. So it has this tendency to transcend uh, different continents uh, because we live in an age where travel is, uh, is more accessible. Okay, so why do we continue to face issues with influenza? So the virus has demonstrated a tremendous ability to be able to change itself. So, and it undergoes changes really from time to time. So there are two concepts with influenza. So the first one is called antigenic shift. 
This is mainly seen with influenza type A and hence um, its propensity to cause pandemics. So these are major changes in the genome which result in changes in both the hemagglutinin and the neuroaminidase um, proteins. And these cause immunity that was acquired with influenza to be rendered, uh, to be rendered uh, important. And then we also have the antigenic drift, which we see with uh, influenza B and influenza C. So these are minor changes. So that's why we don't really see as many pandemics due to influenza B as we would with influenza C. So as you can see, again, just um, going into the history, these are the subtypes that have come from these uh, variations. So you notice that we have the H1N1, which was in 1918. Then you notice that uh, uh, about uh, 30, 40 years later, we had H3N3. This was a different type of influenza A, but due to these antigenic shifts that occurred. So where do these new types of influenza come from? So with influenza, we have three major uh, reservoirs. So we have birds. So these are typically avian birds. They form the highest reservoir of influenza in nature. But we also have, have pigs as well. And then we also have the human hosts. So the interplay between where the virus is coming from is really complex. So you can have the virus moving between pigs to human beings or from a bird to a to a pig and so on. And this is because, again, uh, uh, we humans share some receptors in common with these animals and influenza, the influenza virus is able to, to enter the cells using these, these receptors. So you can see that it's really a, a complex interplay between different hosts. The current strain that uh, we do have right now is the strain that we had from um, the 2009 uh, virus. So the virus can spread from birds to human beings. It can spread as well um, from pigs to human beings. So that is why when you look at the World Health Organization and um, international bodies, they have uh, an operating procedure called SPA. And with SPA, it simply means that one of the first things, the S stands for surveillance. So we, we know that we are going to have another outbreak of flu. We know that we're going to have another respiratory outbreak. It's just a matter of when. So surveillance is really continuous for this, uh, for this uh, respiratory virus. And it has garnered attention this year again, because as you saw, we've crossed the threshold from the green to the, the, to the, to the orange. So this is just, again, illustrating uh, where we're coming from. Uh, and the reason why we don't have influenza B pandemics because uh, influenza B has no non-animal reservoir and the antigenic changes with influenza B tend to be uh, limited to antigenic drifts. Uh, so let's uh, go a bit into the clinical picture now and how patients present. So patients will come usually with fever, headache, myalgia. So with influenza, sometimes the onset of symptoms can be very, very abrupt quite a number of patients will actually be able to point out to the exact moment that they that they fail ill because the symptoms can be very, very abrupt. And then in quite a number of patients, what we do see is that the systemic symptoms will usually precede the respiratory symptoms. So someone may have a fever, may have malaise, and then later they get a cough. Other things that we see with influenza sometimes are ocular symptoms. So these may be, a person may have photophobia or eye pain, uh, or even um, uh, just uh, uh, eye pain on movement, which, which we may see. We don't typically have GI symptoms, um, but uh, they can be there in a minority of patients. So most patients with influenza will have self-limited disease, but we have people that uh, can go on to develop complications and we'll look at these complications. So people that are very young, in terms of numbers, anyone under the age of five, though it's more pronounced in those under the ages of two, then the elderly, so again, over 50, but more pronounced in those over 65. So with immunocompromised, both HIV related and unrelated can cause um, uh, a person to progress to severe influenza disease, and then pre-existing disease, especially cardiopulmonary disease. So let's look at the pulmonary complications. So of course, young children can develop croup. 
Then as we have seen in this uh, season, we can have primary influenza pneumonia. We can also have secondary bacterial infection. And again, as we have seen from some of our surveillance data, we can have patients with a mixed pneumonia, that is pneumonia both with influenza and with uh, bacteria. In terms of bacteria, the three main organisms that have been isolated from these patients are uh, staph, strep, and hemophilus. Another noteworthy pulmonary complication with um, influenza is the exacerbation of disease in patients that have chronic respiratory conditions. So let's look at primary viral influenza pneumonia because we've seen quite a, quite a bit. So it's not very common among these three, but it's the most severe of the pneumonic complications. And again, patients with cardiopulmonary disease tend to be most at risk. So these patients who have acute influenza, that will not relent. So usually because when influenza starts within two to three days, we expect that the symptoms will start to wane down. So these patients will have progressive disease until they finally develop shortness of breath and hypoxia. The sputum production can be scanty. It's not really a productive cough. is not the hallmark of this, though some people can report signs of, of hemoptysis with um, with this type of influenza. So the physical signs are, are scanty during early in the illness, but later on we do find uh, patients presenting with crackles and sometimes wheezes and other signs of, of respiratory disease. And if we do an arterial blood gas in these patients, it usually shows marked hypoxia. Uh, when we look at chest imaging, I'm, I'll be happy to demonstrate some, some images. So these patients will have usually bilateral disease uh, sometimes patch infiltrates that suggest acute respiratory distress syndrome. In patients that have demise from this condition, biopsy will just show really diffuse inflammation of the alveoli with uh, cellular infiltrates and uh, some thrombi in the capillaries. So secondary bacterial pneumonia is a bit different from primary influenza pneumonia. So these patients will typically present with patients of influenza, and then the condition will, will seem to sort of subside and as the condition is subsiding, the symptoms will now come with a resurgence and where we see marked signs of bacterial pneumonia, which are usually a purulent cough and then um, physical signs of consolidation like bronchial breath sounds. And these will be corroborated on, on imaging. And again, just a reminder, because this is key for your antibiotic therapy, the three most common pathogens isolated in these are strep, staph, and hemophilus. I should mention that in Zambia, from our surveillance, we have had some Moraxella as well that we've isolated from these patients, but by and large, it, it's been consistent with this, this picture. Then finally, the, the mixed uh, viral and bacterial pneumonia. So again, this happens quite a lot. We've seen a lot of it uh, for those that attended the last surveillance uh, meeting that we had. So these patients will have a more gradual disease, but it will tend to worsen over time. And then the signs of bacterial pneumonia will start to kick in where they develop as well a purulent cough. And when we do cultures for these patients, we'll isolate both um, the virus and, and the bacteria. Uh, so, and of course, patients with cardiovascular and pulmonary complications are, are more susceptible to this, to this sort of, of complication. So I'm happy to demonstrate some images from some of our patients. So this was a patient from, from Levi Manawasa. And you can notice again, you look at the bilateral disease. This is um, some ground glass opacities on, on both uh, sides. This was a patient with respiratory distress who presented with a prodrome initially of uh, uh, influenza-like symptoms and went on to progress to respiratory disease. This is another patient as well. Um, same symptoms with the same picture. You will notice that again, the disease is bilateral, a bit more on the right. Uh, then on the right, we've started to go into the consolidation stage. It's probably a patient who must have had some super added bacterial infection because there's almost consolidation happening. So you can see we have 10, maybe 20 more of these x-rays. And you know, it's not an accident that we get patients presenting with a similar, similar picture in an isolated location. Okay, so the non-pulmonary complications, the biggest ones are the myositis, uh, which is rare, thankfully, but can get very severe to the point of, of people getting muscles bulging and, and becoming tender. 
And then we have the cardiac complications, which have been reported uh, myositis uh, and pericarditis, but these are rare. We have uh, encephalopathy and encephalitis, as well as, as rare syndrome. Another in interesting one is Gillian Barre syndrome, which is rare as well, but has been reported. We would have cases of Gillian Barre syndrome after vaccination with the with a swine flu vaccine, but um, again, this is this is quite rare in terms of modern day because um, the vaccines have have changed. The major causes of of, of, um, of mortality in influenza are pulmonary complications, so it's bacterial pneumonia, and of course cardiac failure, but especially bacterial pneumonia. Most of the patients, according to foreign data that die uh, over the age of 65, though I will mention that the picture that we've had for our current outbreak is, is slightly different. We have had um, the, the mortality that has been recorded uh, was a patient who was um, aged less than 50 and had no obvious uh, risk factors for severe disease. In terms of diagnosis, so there are various ways to diagnose um, the the, the virus. So of course you can isolate the virus from a nasal swab or from sputum. Then there's uh, the growth of the virus in tissue culture of eggs, but this is typically not done because it's um, a labor intensive process. Then we have serology. So serology is mostly used for epidemiological purposes because we're going to get the humoral response usually a week uh, or two after the symptoms appear. And at this point, uh, most people with influenza will have had the symptoms subsiding. So we usually use serology, not for clinical purposes, but for surveillance purposes. Then of course, a PCR is, is the most sensitive uh, test, but we also have rapid diagnostic tests that are of variable um, sensitivity. In an outbreak, sometimes the clinical picture plus the history of an outbreak can be enough to, to make a, a diagnosis. Other laboratory tests are generally not very helpful in terms of diagnosis. So the leukocyte count can either be high or low. And so really the focus is on isolating the virus. So uh, in terms of other things to think about, during an outbreak, it can be, uh, it can be plausible to make a diagnosis of, uh, of influenza based on, on clinical grounds because we are having so many of these uh, Patients, but outside an outbreak, it's it's very difficult for you to say that a patient has has influenza because these symptoms can be caused by a variety of of pathogens and mimicked by by a variety of pathogens. So uh, that has to be kept in mind. Now let's look at principles of treatment for patients with uh, influenza pneumonia. So again. For influenza pneumonia, the biggest thing is the need to maintain oxygenation and, of course, provide adequate hemodynamic support. Uh, we have some data from a few studies that shows that uh, treatment with antivirals does reduce the, the, the incidence of, of uh, lower respiratory complications and hospitalization. And then we have some data that supports the use of antivirals uh, for patients with severe disease because uh, there's a reduction in mortality. In terms of antibiotics, so these should be reserved for patients who uh, there is a plausible suspicion that there is bacterial co-infection. And again, this should cover for staph, strep, and hemophilus um, because those are the key uh, organisms. In terms of antiviral drugs for the treatment of, um, of, uh, of influenza, so of course the, the first one is also Tomivir which can be given either IV or orally. And then we have Zanamivir, which is, uh, can be given uh, as an inhalation. So these are the therapies that are, are being given. So there is, uh, of course, other therapies that can be used like ribavirin for different uh, kinds of, of influenza, but these two are the, are the mainstay of treatment. Now, steroids, uh, we know that uh, for patients with COVID-19 uh, and severe disease, steroids are, are used, but for influenza, the data that we have is that uh, steroids actually cause negative outcomes, so they are not used for the treatment of influenza. In terms of symptomatic treatment, we don't really have anything out of the 
ordinary here. So it's basically targeting the symptoms. So analgesics for pain, the congestants for congestion, and the cough suppressants for cough and uh, sore throat and, and the like. Now, I would like to bring attention to oxygen. Again, I think this is where we can leverage the amount of knowledge that we've garnered on, on oxygenation. Um, so hypoxia has to be treated because hypoxia is fatal even in this patient. So uh, oxygen is, is key. In terms of prevention, of course, how do we go about prevention? So the first one is, of course, avoiding close contact, especially with people that are showing symptoms and then staying at home for those that are symptomatic. I, I do know that uh, uh, at my workplace, my boss gave an express order to say that if you have any symptoms, please just stay home, don't, don't show up at work. And, and then of course, there's the usual covering of the nose and mouth uh, and cleaning of hands, and then just practicing good hygiene. Uh, so these are really good habits for prevention in, a, in an outbreak like like this one. Of course, avoiding touching your eyes, your nose and mouth. As I did allude to earlier to say that the surface method of, of transmission for influenza has not uh, been proven uh, entirely 100%, but in an outbreak like this, it's something that uh, will go can go a long way in preventing uh, infection. So then the influenza vaccine. So the influenza vaccine is usually an annual vaccine that's given to eligible populations and so who is eligible for this? So usually for children under the age of five, these are considered to have um, increased risk of, of severe disease. So these are eligible for this vaccine. And then any child uh, with any chronic disease, so it could be respiratory, it could be pulmonary, it could be hepatic or, or neuromuscular, any child who is immunosuppressed, uh, and then also patients that are receiving long-term aspirin therapy because they might get race syndrome. Other children that uh, and adolescents that might be eligible for for long term care are uh, those are uh, for for vaccination are those that are attending uh, long term care facilities, and then of course uh, those adolescents and children that uh, this will apply more to adolescents that may fall pregnant during the influenza season. We do not have any data on children under the age of six months, so these are currently not recommended for vaccination. For adults, uh, so adults, um, so of course, any adult that wants to reduce the risk of becoming ill can be vaccinated. But again, the emphasis is on those at high risk of severe disease. So people older than the age of 50, uh, pregnant uh, uh, people, and then those that have uh, chronic diseases, especially pulmonary and cardiovascular, as well as the immunosuppressed. Um, so, in terms of contact people, so especially household contacts, uh, of those with chronic diseases as well, these should consider getting, getting vaccinated. Um, before we end, so this is uh, just before the last slide, so just a quick comparison between influenza and COVID-19. Again, a reminder that influenza has been around for quite some time. COVID is, is something new. Then with uh, the transmission method, so with influenza, it's more pronounced, uh, again, with aerosols, you'll notice that COVID has a longer incubation period there. And then, of course, there are some symptoms that are peculiar to COVID that we've not seen with influenza, like loss of sense of taste and, and, and smell. And then the case fatality ratio for COVID is slightly higher. And then, uh, unlike um, in COVID, uh, usually we isolate influenza from mostly respiratory specimens, while COVID has been isolated from, from other specimens. In terms of uh, seasonality, we see most of our cases in the cold months, but with COVID, we continue to, to record cases. And of course, uh, to wind up uh, the comparison, in terms of vaccines with influenza, we have the annual influenza vaccine. And then with COVID-19, we currently have the various vaccines that are given, usually the preliminary and the booster. And then, of course, there's that difference in treatment. Uh, we have seen some people giving remdese remdesivir empirically. They think it's COVID. So remdesivir is for COVID-19. Then oseltamivir is for, is for influenza. Um, another thing noteworthy is that with asymptomatic transmission, this is seen more with COVID than with influenza. So hence that emphasis for people to stay away from, from symptomatic patients. 
Um, the global impact, I think, is is something that uh, seems to be waning for COVID-19, but with influenza, it's something that has been around for a long time. And we do know from our past data that we, we it's something that continues up to date. So with those words, I would like to go back to the poll questions, maybe let the, the IT team run the poll questions and then we'll go through the explanations for each one of them. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stanika. And uh, we'll go back to the polls, seeing that uh, the, the didactic presentation has, has come almost to the end. And we'd love to get feedback from the network to see if it's if learning took place. So the first poll is running, which of the following types of influenza have been isolated in Zambia? So we have type A, type B, both type A and B. I still encourage that the network responds to the poll so that we get to see and uh, have feedback. Allow the poll to run for for the next uh, 15 seconds, we are at 46% uh, so far. Next five seconds, I'll close the poll. Which of the following types of influenza have been isolated in Zambia? Type A, C type B, or both influenza type A and B? Okay, to end the first poll, and uh, that's the feedback. So we have 81% uh, confidently saying that we've isolated both influenza type A and type B. We still have 13% uh, that feel it's only type A, and 6% uh, that are confident that it's only type B. So that's the feedback to the first poll, Dr. Chisanika. Okay, so... Again, just to echo what was um, mentioned in the first uh, part of the presentation, we've isolated both influenza type A and type B. It's been mostly type A, but even type B has been isolated. Again, just to remind the house of the differences between the two. So type A is more prone to having those major changes. Uh, so it's responsible for more outbreaks. We don't see as many changes in viral structure with type B. So the Severity and outbreaks are usually more limited. That's the answer. So the majority got this uh, answer correct. Okay. We can run the second poll question. So the second poll question. This one is a true or false. Serology is a useful clinical tool for the diagnosis of influenza. Okay. So the network is still is, is responding, which is a very good thing. It's a true or false. Like we said, we don't get to see your, your feedback as an individual, but we get to see the statistics. So we are all encouraged to participate. And uh, so serology is a useful clinical tool for the diagnosis of influenza. Is it true? Is it false? So far, we are at 47% participation network. We are encouraged to participate. Okay, so in the next uh, six seconds, I'll close the poll. Okay. Okay, so the feedback is that uh, the 2% are saying serology is a use of clinical tool for the diagnosis of influenza, and 8% are saying no. Dr. Stanek. Yeah, so... Yeah, in contrast to the first question here, the majority have it wrong. So by the time the antibodies for influenza are actually starting to show up in the bloodstream, most patients have already stopped shedding the influenza virus. So for the use in clinical medicine, it's not very useful. What we do use it for is in terms of epidemiological um, studies. So most of us have antibodies to influenza. And what will typically be done is that uh, uh, serum will be collected. 
when someone has symptoms and then uh, the titers will be measured. And then three, four weeks later, a repeat serum measurement can be done. But by that time, the person has already stopped shedding virus. So the serology is used more for epidemiological purposes, just to know that someone had influenza. But in terms of influencing your clinical management of the patient, serology does not have any use. So we should not routinely expect people collecting samples for influenza IgM and, and IgG because uh, it's, they are not useful clinically. So I hope again that explanation is clear to say that by the time the antibodies show up in the, in the bloodstream, most people have already stopped shedding the virus and uh, the symptoms have, have resolved. So we don't use this to in clinical management, we use it more for surveillance. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stanley. So we'll run the third poll, which is uh, the last poll. Okay. So steroids are a mainstay of treatment in patients with uh, pneumonia due to influenza. So this is again a true or false. Uh, so let's participate. I'm glad that the network is, uh, is responding confidently. I will share the results. Steroids. They are the mainstay of treatment in patients with uh, pneumonia due to influenza, true or false? We had 41% participation network, let's participate. Still have like 10 seconds before I close the poll. So this is the feedback to touch Sanika. We have eighty three percent that are saying false, and then we have uh, we still have seventeen percent that are saying uh, steroids that are the mainstay of treatment in patients with pneumonia due to influenza. Doctor Stanik. Uh, thank you, Doctor Doctor Moro. So again, the majority here have it true. So again, steroids have been associated with increased morbidity and mortality, and they are used in the treatment of uh, of influenza and pneumonia. So uh, the correct answer is uh, false. Uh, I hope that that's clear. Thank you. Okay, so at this moment, we would love to get uh, contributions, questions from the network, uh, and also from the panel of experts. If there is anything they would love to add. And then we also attend to the chat box. Some of the questions were coming as the didactic presentation was running. So we, we still encourage people to use the chat box. And then if you want to speak, you may just uh, indicate by raising your hand and then uh, we'll give you the platform to either ask or rather contribute. So some of the questions from the chat box, um, is there any influenza rapid test commercially available? So this is a question that's coming from uh, Joseph uh, Congolo. Is there any influenza rapid test that's commercially available? Uh, Dr. Monza, do you want to respond to that one? Sure. Um, yes, there are a number, quite a lot of um, influenza rapid tests available on the market. Um, they are not as uh, sensitive as the PCR tests that we are using. But um, I think um, in an outbreak situation um, where you know that there's influenza circulating, they can be useful in a clinical setting to confirm uh, infection. I think Dr. Chitanika mentioned that um, some uh, uh, times in an outbreak, uh, a clinical diagnosis can be made and an RTD can be useful uh, for, for that purpose. But usually they, they don't uh, tell you more than this is flu A or flu B. They won't tell you 
uh, things like subtype, so they're not as useful in surveillance. Over. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for that feedback. Then we also have some few questions in the chat box and uh, with regards to... Sorry, Dr. Mwewa, uh, yeah. Mr. Davis Kampamba has his, hands up, his hand up. Mr. Kampamba, you may go ahead and... Uh, okay. okay. Thank you so much, Kawaso, and uh, great presentation. Again, apologies, just in case I missed uh, what I, uh, I wanted Dr. Stanika to really emphasize. Oh, we, are coming, we, we are coming from the COVID <laughs> pandemic where we saw rampant abuse of antibiotics. And you, you remember very well any COVID-like symptoms, azithro was a thing. I hope this time around we are not going to fall in the, in, in the same trap especially that a lot of people out there have simply concluded to say, I know even this is COVID, they're not just telling us. So why not just self-medicate? Because even when you go to hospital, they'll give you antibiotics anyway. So I think we really need to be deliberate on that, uh, that people need to avoid uh, this rampant abuse of antibiotics unless prescribed by uh, by a healthcare provider. And even for healthcare providers, it's not every flu equals an antibiotic. And in this case, azithro, we may just lose it before we realize. Over your comment, of course. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kampamba. I think just uh, to echo, um, to answer your question, I didn't directly address it, but there was a part when we were looking at the complications of influenza and really what we expect and when you need antibiotics is when someone starts developing the overt signs of a bacterial infection. So these would be maybe the development of a purulent cough or for those that are observing uh, blood counts, so the development of leukocytosis. Someone had a normal white cell count and then now as time progresses on, the fever is not going away, the white cell count starts going up with neutrophilia. Then in that moment in time, you, you should collect a sample uh, just to send to see what sort of bacteria you're treating and you can treat empirically. But just routinely, again, the symptoms of, of sore throat, the symptoms of nasal congestion and cough with most patients with influenza, they are self-limiting and will tend to go away. I know we have uh, on our expert panel, Dr. Matibula. Would you like to make a comment on this as well? All right, uh, I'm actually with Dr. Chitanika here. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Kampamba. I think it's, it's a point that we really, really have to emphasize that, you know, it's a viral infection and of course the antivirus and I hope the pharmacy team can update on availability of some of these antivirals that we use for influenza. But by and large, antibiotics are not indicated for influenza unless there is a suspicion of a bug. We know that uh, influenza actually predisposes to subsequent development of a bacterial pneumonia, but there are some telltale signs that can help. For instance, as in the presentation where you have patient with uh, influenza, they over the, the the next two, three days, they seem to have improved and then suddenly they become worse. That might be an indication to suspect that, okay, there might be a complication of a bacterial infection. And we've seen the common bugs that are usually isolated in these patients. Commonly, you see bugs like streptococcus pneumonia, uh, even stuff sometimes. Uh, strep pyogens and the like. So those are the ones we want to cover. But in some cases, you may have other bugs like Moraxella, uh, Haemophilus influenza and the like. So it's just in cases where you suspect that there might be uh, a superimposed bacterial infection, which can be after the influenza or they can actually happen at the same time, the influenza pneumonia and the bacterial pneumonia at the same time, especially for those who tend to not really 
uh, improve. They have this influenza illness, but this illness seems to be worsening over time. Fevers are still persisting, leukocytosis coming up, and then the cough suddenly becomes purulent. You may suspect that that may uh, that patient may actually have both uh, influenza pneumonia and the bacterial pneumonia together. That is for infection. Yeah, but by and large, we have those um, antivirals that are used for uh, influenza, the neuraminidase inhibitors like Oseltamavir. Uh, we have drugs like uh, Zanamavir for influenza and the other groups as well. Probably just a comment from the pharmacy team on availability, or if there are indeed plans by a ministry to probably procure some of those drugs, uh, especially the first line like Saltamaga, which is known commonly by the trade name of Tamiflu, um, and also issues to do with vaccination. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that feedback, which even answers to the question that came from Christian Senga. Take us through on the treatment of influenza, I mean drugs, and uh, Dr. Matikula has attended to that just now. Thank you so much. And then now, uh, we have a hand from uh, Anita. Please go ahead and uh, make your contribution or your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, I have a question for Dr. Monze. I don't know if this question was asked or if it was answered uh, because I, I dropped off at some point. But I've just been thinking about influenza surveillance in the current uh you know, um, COVID era. So I just wanted a comment from Dr. Monze on on um, equitable access to testing services for influenza. Then number two is um, when you look at the, the data that she showed us, um, I'm wondering if the virology lab at UTH is also following the rapid tests for COVID that uh, we are doing, because I think that is the um, what what we are testing mostly, what we're using to test for COVID mostly, uh, so that we compare properly um, the COVID tests and the influenza tests to see how these two uh, viral infections are matching each other in terms of um, current statistics. Then I had a question for Dr. Chitanika. Um, just, I think it would be important for all of us on the call to understand what the protocol is now for those who might have both COVID and influenza. Uh, in, in, in a situation where we have, um, of course, I know that maybe Tamiflu isn't, isn't uh, available at the moment, but is it recommended for the patient who has both COVID and influenza and qualifies to take antivirals, to take both antivirals or would one antiviral work? I think that that would be a good um, conversation for us on the call. Thank you so much. So either Dr. Monze or Dr. Stanika may. Uh, we will allow Dr. Monze to, to respond to the first question. Okay. Then uh, we'll respond with the clinical question. Uh, thank you. Um, equitable access to testing. Uh, the, the program that we are running is uh, strictly a surveillance program. And um, the patients who are recruited uh, in that program, we just sample the population. We don't just test uh, everybody. And this is because for surveillance, you want to um, control or to, to, to have uh, controlled parameters, like the case definition must be exact so that you are able to interpret your data uh, meaningfully. Uh, so those who happen to participate in the surveillance uh, uh, benefit in that we give them back that uh, test result. But for 
um, clinical management for um, uh, uh, each patient to be able to have a test result. Uh, I think that is um, a, a different objective than what we are trying to achieve. And I know that uh, the Ministry of Health uh, is uh, embarking on a, a multi-pathogen uh, diagnostic uh, program where they will be providing access to such testing for all patients. Um, the second question I think you were asking is whether we are using an RDT. Uh, no. For surveillance, we are not using RDTs. We are using a, a multiplex PCR test. So it's PCR for flu and PCR for COVID. So the COVID data I showed you is PCR data. Over. Thank you. Thank for you. That. Uh Oh, sorry, uh, so Doctor, we have Dr. Foloshi as well. Uh, we thought maybe she would also just address uh, that question on, on the testing for the clinicians that are, that are, that are on the call. Yes. Uh, Anita, are you able to hear Dr. Foloshi? Yes, no? I can. Thank you. Okay, please go ahead, Dr. Foloshi. This is so I think that's an important question and it's very valid. So whatever data we are seeing is um, definitely bad. But as Dr. Monde says, um, the surveillance team was set up for just a surveillance of influenza. Because at a certain threshold, when you start reaching your epidemic threshold, you actually stop testing and making a presumptive diagnosis. However, the Ministry of Health, in partnership with the CDC through CIDERS, is funding a very big, big program where we are going to strengthen microbiological capacity in the country. But even more importantly, is the open PCR platform, which essentially means these platforms can be open for any diagnostic test. And one of them in the first kits to come in country is for influenza A and B. So we are currently piloting at UTH and Livingstone will be the first site to actually pre implement. I must mention, I think in terms of equity, it should be equitable for access to diagnostics, but how you interpret that, of course, is another story altogether. So all the 10 provinces in Zambia should be able to do this. However, these have not been commissioned yet, and uh, Livingstone is just trying out its machine. Um, so this has offered an opportunity for us to be able to test our test patients. And we are currently doing it at UTH, but we are still learning a lot from this. Algorithms have been developed. The guidelines should be out anytime soon. And we hope the rest of the country should be able to pick up uh, on influenza or other pathogens. But of course, this depends on what your kid is able to, to test overall. I must mention, once it's commissioned in Livingstone, we are hoping this will be at the end of July. We will um, come on echo and talk uh, about the national normal pathogen diagnostic platform. Wait, Peter, Anita. Okay, so yeah, uh, thanks, if I may, if I may comment, the the surveillance data is is uh, it's a sample, but uh, it is interpreted uh, alongside uh, data on total admissions, data on total respiratory admissions. So it's not it's not biased because you you look at it with the denominator in view. Over. Okay, thank you. I, I think we'll get the hand from uh, uh, Masiku and then we'll respond to some of the questions in the chat box. So Masiku may go ahead to mute and uh, give your contribution or question. Okay, what is the uh, wait for that question from Masiku? We have some questions in the chat box uh, from uh, Dr. Mbewa Nyuma. How long is protection from a uh, natural infection with uh, influenza? Vis-a-vis -vis how long after a confirmed case can someone have a reinfection? And then uh, another question, uh, 
that, that came also in the chat box is about uh, the vaccine. What name is given to those that are between six to 18 years? Uh, this is a question that's coming from Sophia. Then uh, the other one from uh, Chilowa is saying, uh, what medication are responding well to the isolated influenza that we are currently facing? So maybe we can attend to these three and then I will read the next three questions. What's the, the right. I, um, so this is Dr. Matipula. I understand there was a question to do with a patient who has both COVID and influenza, exactly. if you can use the same antiviral. Yeah. For instance, you have this stable patient who uh, is eligible for Paxlovid and then also has influenza. So Paxlovid, which is a combination of nematrovir boosted with return of a uh, no data shows activity against um, uh, influenza. So you would have to give both. Uh, you give the Paxlovid for the COVID. If it's, uh, let's say, COVID, non-severe non COVID, and they, they are eligible for Paxlovid, and then they have influenza, again, they are eligible for Oseltamavir. You would have to give both Paxlovid and then plus Oseltamavir because Oseltamavir is also an oral drug. So in cases where you, you are giving this eligible patient who's at risk of complications or risk of hospitalization, the Osotamavir is given as an oral drug, 75 milligrams twice a day for about five days. So you'd have to give both. So Paxlovid won't cover uh, that. Similarly, for very severe patients, those who require admission, you've given them remdesivir for the, um, for the COVID-19, you would have to give them Osotamavir as well for the influenza if they have both. Um, so part of it doesn't um, cover that. Then it was mentioned that yes, steroids uh, for influenza pneumonia are not indicated because they increase um, mortality from studies. However, steroids can be administered if there is a separate indication for giving the steroids. If the patient has got a separate indication and they have influenza, then you would give them, but not for the influenza. Uh, with regard to natural infection, uh, antibodies, some studies show somewhere around six months. Yeah, so in most regions that have these seasonal uh, flus, they actually give uh, the, vac the vaccine every year. So it's around six months to a year. That's when it wins off. So you'd have to uh, still give uh, the vaccine, even with the vaccination, you still have to give it every every year. Over. Okay, so, uh, so I'll read the next three questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitamika and Dr. Monza for your presentation. Does the surveillance data suggest that we should be bracing ourselves for increased number and severity of influenza cases? Uh, how often do we share surveillance data locally? And does one access this data? Then lastly, should we prioritize in making vaccines available? Okay, that is uh, from Mabamlenga. Um, then uh, we also have others that are also asking about the vaccine already available at the medicines for, for the influenza, the antiviral medication, and also another one is asking about the, the vaccines. And then there's this other one which is saying, are there specific medications given for prophylaxis? So maybe we can respond to those. Okay. No, thank you so much. I think those are very pertinent questions that need answers. So uh, I'll run through them. So first, uh, the big um, question about medications for, for influenza. Uh, I will let you know that uh, the, the Minister of Health has uh, has spent more on um, sorry, we are getting a bit of disturbance from the background. So there are processes underway, I think, to, to bring these drugs. If you did follow the ministerial statement, 
the, the Honorable Minister of Health, I think, in a parliamentary speech alluded to this, to say that the government has set in process uh, the, the procedure. So that's my response to that question. I'll, I'll ride on the, on the ministerial statement. Secondly, I think there's also a question to say, looking at this, should we brace ourselves for an increase in cases of, of influenza? I think from the data, if you saw, and I think that was the whole reason why we allowed uh, Dr. Monza to present, we are seeing some sort of upward trend. Uh, we are moving from the green into the, the green, which is like uh, low level risk into the orange, which is moderate level risk. So yes, I, I would say we need to, to brace, brace ourselves. And by bracing ourselves, it doesn't mean panic or anything. It simply means that becoming more aware uh, that influenza is there because at the end of the day, this is not just for shows. We've lost lives. We've lost a life uh, from this. So it's it's not just for show. We need to be to be very very aware that that this is with us. Um, uh, and then, um, sorry, there's another question that was that was asked. Uh, I know they they came in a flurry. Yes, so medications for prophylaxis. So the number one way for prophylaxis is vaccination. Again, in terms of vaccination, someone had asked how readily available the vaccines are. So uh, a statement will be issued about this in, in due course. Again, I don't want to, to preempt, uh, but a statement is going to be issued in due course over, over that. In terms of medications that are used for prophylaxis, so in certain situations, the same antiviral drug or say tell me that can be used for, for prophylaxis. Uh, so for instance, uh, a practical example I would give is maybe let's say someone is a person that has received an organ transplant and they are on immunosuppressive medication. And then they come into contact with, uh, with a person who has confirmed influenza. Then in such cases, it would be, it would be plausible to give a prophylaxis. So, uh, that's uh, the response to, to those questions. Okay, we can take the, the contribution or question from uh, Tembo. The hand is, is, is up. And then uh, Dr. Masiku has uh, posted, so the hand was up, but he's now posted in the chat box. I agree with you, Doc and the use of antibiotics, especially that these patients sometimes are presented with high-grade fever, and people tend to use thinking there is a co-infection of bacterial cause, especially in the absence of PCR test or a DT for influenza. This is so insightful and uh, knowledgeable, thank you. I just hope that antiviral drugs will be available in all facilities, thank you. And then there are other questions on, uh, on the ant antivirals, you don't post the vaccines, but we've been guided. Any guidance to institutions using biometric clocking system in relation to the risk of transmission? <laughs> Very interesting question. Any guidance to institutions using biometric clocking system in relation to the risk of transmission? With the same one, there's also another question about um, gatherings and all that, any measures uh, being taken, especially with regards to uh, public gatherings. So for for that uh, question, I know we have uh, we have the Dr. Newman Bell from ZNPHI. Uh, maybe she can be able to to address that uh, that query. Yeah, I think she she's dropped off, but she was she was she was in the meeting. Um, yeah, so so I think another comment on prevention probably would you know that you know it's the way it spreads. Uh, I think Dr. Stanika earlier mentioned there's droplet spread. So whenever there are such uh, conditions. Obviously, hand hygiene is something that has to be put in place. As you saw, influenza can actually survive outside 
about less than eight hours. So you can still, there's a theoretical risk of getting it from touching surfaces. So um, hand hygiene is very, uh, very important in terms of preventing infection and also uh, masking as well to add on to, um, uh, to that. Thank you. Uh, I've seen there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of questions in the chat box, but maybe this last one, especially that seeing that we also have uh, people that are coming from the primary health care uh, facilities. So there is a question: Is there any protocol for empiric treatment if they receive a patient and they are fully convinced that this is influenza? How do they approach it for someone who is in the in a very remote facility? Maybe we address this question and then the others, uh, I'm sure they will, the feedback can be given uh, later on. And to those that are asking for slides, I'm glad that you've registered uh, to Echo platform and they will be uploaded and you'll be able to access them. But that last question from the technical team, any protocol for empiric treatment? Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Moore. I think that's that's a very, very important question um, and a very practical one. So I think for now, the, the thrust is really more on uh, getting diagnosis. We've not reached uh, pandemic proportions where we should, you know, just uh, treat. Uh, so I think for now, the, the goal should be uh, on getting a, a test done. And that's why we have all these surveillance mechanisms that that are being put in place. So for now, uh, I think if if such measures are necessary, guidance will be given. But for now, uh, I would suggest let's focus on on getting the diagnosis right. Thank you. Thank you for that. I also have a comment from uh, Mr. Kampamba. Ministry has initiated procurement for September. And this process has been expedited. So fingers crossed that this drug will be, will be in soon. Glad to hear that. And then there's a question about the facilities that are not part of our Sentinel surveillance. I think uh, Dr. Monze can respond to this one. For the facilities that are not part of the Sentinel surveillance, can samples be taken to UTH, especially for those testing negative for COVID? We can take this the last one. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I don't think at this point we have the capacity to be able to handle uh, what we are. What we have is mainly for the surveillance and uh, very limited testing uh, just yet on the NMTPP platform, uh, which we are um, uh, using to support the response in UTH and Levi Manawasa. Over. Thank you. Uh, network, we are at now 16.03. We are glad for the total participation and we can see that uh, uh, people, they want to understand the, the influenza that we have and that uh, they want to care for their patients nicely and properly. Glad that we, at the peak, we are even going as far as 438 and uh, the network has been very active. Uh, thank you everyone for participating and uh, for coming through. And uh, to the didactic presenters, uh, Dr. Uh, Monze and Dr. Chitanika, thank you so much for our availability and for, for the knowledge shared. And also thank you to the expert panel that was available. And to everyone else uh, from the ECHO team, we say thank you so much. And um, thumbs up to the IT team, uh, Mr. Chatonda, as well as uh, uh, Mr. Kote that have been there, available for us, and the coordinator, uh, Kunda, who was with us. To everyone else, my name is uh, Kabaso Moyawa. Thank you so much and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you and bye. Thank you, bye.